Alrighty, so we're going to move on to our next topic, which is on um, food webs, food chains, and how matter and energy move throughout an ecosystem. Um, let me screen share. So our first thing that you want to be doing is your attendance form, making sure that you get your attendance credit. The second thing is the Ed Puzzle that you're currently on, making sure that you're going through. Um, if you need to, write down notes for yourself to help you remember the information and answering the questions throughout the process of the Ed Puzzle. Third thing is the interactive journal. So after this, you're going to go to the section of your interactive journal that you're on and complete those pages before you do your last and final thing, which is your exit ticket. Now, for the do now question for today, it's going to be, first off, what is the difference between biotic and abiotic? Now, give me an explanation of the definitions will suffice. Um, just telling me what the difference is um, in their meanings is also fine. So however you think the difference can be explained best, explain that. Second question, primary succession starts from blank and secondary succession starts from blank. So pick the answer that best fits uh, the blanks and um, hopefully you get it right. All right, so now to answer the question, what is the difference between biotic and abiotic? Remember, biotic means living or was living, right? So anything that, any organism that is living or was living is biotic. On the other hand, abiotic means non-living. And non-living also includes the never has been living before category, right? So an example of something biotic is a fish, whether it's dead or alive. And then an example of something that's abiotic is the air, because the air is not alive and never has been alive. And then the answer to the second one is primary succession starts from bare rock or rock, and secondary succession starts from soil or dirt or whatever version of that. So for this class, students will be able to list the different trophic levels and explain how energy moves through it. Okay, it meaning the food web, the ecosystem, any of the above. Now, again, ecology is the study of the relationships that organisms have with other organisms and with their natural environment. Since we're talking about food webs, we're probably more going to be talking about the relationships between organisms today. So an ecosystem includes both biotic and abiotic factors, remember, right? So in a food web, we're just talking about the interactions between like the deer, the fish, the frog, the eagle, and the turtles. Um, and then in like an overall ecology standpoint, we would also be talking about the water and the air and the rocks and the soil and the sun, right? So this word is a niche, so niches, right? Each species in an ecosystem has its own role to play. This role is called a niche. So the scientific word for a role is just niche. That's, that's the whole point behind this slide, okay? So niche is the same thing as when you have a role in a play, for example, in Romeo and Juliet, and your job is to play Romeo, right? Every animal has its own role inside of its ecosystem. And that role, the term that we use is niche. So we're gonna take a pause right here and think about in a specific ecosystem, what is a biotic factor example that you can give and an abiotic factor example, okay? So I'm gonna ask that you guys fill these out and tell me, first of all, in a pond ecosystem, what's an example of a biotic factor? I gave you frog, but give me another one. Now, in a pond ecosystem, what's an example of an abiotic factor? I gave you mud, so give me a different one. Now, in a small forest ecosystem, give me one biotic factor. And now, in a small forest ecosystem, give me one abiotic factor. Cool, so there are a lot of examples, right? For biotic factors, you could talk about anything that's living inside of a pond. That could be like a fish, it could be snails, it could be frogs, right? And then for abiotic factors, you have to talk about anything that's not living in a pond, right? So that could be the water, I already said mud. It could be the sunlight shining through, right? And then a small forest for biotic, there's a lot of options because there's trees, there's all sorts of animals like deer, squirrels, birds. And then for abiotic, you still got rocks, you still got the air, you still got the soil, right? So again, as review, populations are an interbreeding group of individuals of one species in an ecosystem. So in the picture, you see a population of frogs. You can also see just by looking at the frogs that they are all the same species because they look the same, right? And they're interbreeding, AKA they can mate with each other and they can produce babies. And we're talking about limiting factors. Remember when we talked about carrying capacity and overflow and overpopulation? Limiting factors that can cause a carrying capacity to change or to exist 
are conditions that control the population size. For example, food, there's a scarcity of food, the population can't be big then. Disease might shrink a population size. Predators, if they're hunting down a population, they're not gonna get that big, right? And then having available nutrients, right? That also includes water. So carrying capacity again is the maximum population that can live in an area and it's controlled by the limiting factors that we just talked about on the last slide. So major players in an ecosystem. Here we're getting more into the details of starting out of processing a food web. So the sun provides energy for everything on the planet. So all source of energy for all living things comes from the sun, whether you receive it directly or indirectly. Now, we don't photosynthesize, right? Plants do. So they receive the energy from the sun directly, but we get it indirectly because we consume plants or we consume things that consume plants. So producers are all green plants. They're also known as autotrophs, okay? We'll break down the word uh, later. Um, they're called autotrophs because they make their own food using the energy of the sun, okay? Consumers are every organism that eats something else for food. So we are consumers because we're not green and we don't just go stand in the sun to get energy, right? But plants do, or at some parts of plants are green, right? Um, consumers, you consume, so you're called a consumer, makes sense. There are three main groups of consumers now. Herbivores are consumers that get food from plants or consume plants. Carnivores eat meat or flesh to get energy. And then omnivores can eat plants or meat. And then lastly, we have decomposers. They're mainly bacteria and fungi that convert dead matter into gases such as carbon and nitrogen, right? So matter has to be recycled because there's no way to create new matter. Everything that exists on Earth exists in one form or another, and it's only recycled to be used in different forms over and over and over again, but it's not being newly created or destroyed. So let's use our vocabulary. I want you to tell me what category a small insect is considered. Is it a producer, consumer, or decomposer? And if it's a consumer, make sure you tell me if it's an herbivore, if it eats, eats, if it eats plants, if it's a carnivore, if it eats meat, or if it's an omnivore and it eats both. Now tell me, is a small, is it, sorry, is a rabbit a producer, consumer, or decomposer? Is a mushroom a producer, consumer, or decomposer? Is grass a producer, consumer, or decomposer? Is a lion a producer, consumer, or decomposer? Is fungus a producer, consumer, or decomposer? Are humans a producer, composer, uh, sorry, sorry, consumer or decomposer? And lastly, are cats producers, consumers, or decomposers? Cool. Small insects can be consumers, right? And they can be herbivores, carnivores, or omnivores. Rabbits are consumers and they are herbivores. They only eat plants. Mushrooms are decomposers. They generally break things down when they're dead or when they're no longer uh, just recycling nutrients. Uh, grass is a producer. It's green, it gets energy from the sun. It's a plant, right? Lions are consumers and they are carnivores because they are meat eaters. Fungus is the broader category of mushroom, right? So if we said mushroom was a decomposer, fungus is also a decomposer. So it breaks down dead, dead material. Humans are consumers. If you're a vegetarian, right, you would be an herbivore. And if you only ate meat, you'd be a carnivore. But the ma majority of us are omnivores because we eat vegetables and meat. And then lastly, cats are consumers and they are carnivores by nature. All right, so food chains and food webs. Just tell me something that you know about them because I know this isn't the first time you've heard about them. So just give me one fact or one, inf any information or opinion that you have on them. Cool. So food chains, as you can see in the pictures here, a food chain is a route for the transfer of matter and energy, AKA food, through an ecosystem. So up here, you can see a very simple one from grass to bunny to fox. Now, here's the question. What do the arrows mean? Does it mean that the grass is eating the bunny and then the bunny's eating the fox? No. The arrow tells you the direction that energy is moving. So it's kind of confusing in the beginning, but you have to make sure that when you look at the animals, you gotta use your common sense first off and say, do rabbits eat foxes? No, because rabbits are herbivores, so they only eat plants, right? So that's why the arrow is pointing from the grass to the rabbit, because the energy that was in the plants 
moves into the rabbit once the rabbit eats it. Okay, so the arrow is not saying who eats who. The arrow is telling you the direction that the energy is moving. Okay, here you can see that the sun is providing all the energy. Obviously, plants need water. And then the grass is being consumed and passing its energy to the grasshopper, which is passing its energy to the snake when it gets eaten and passing the energy to the hawk when the hawk eats the snake. Now, when the hawk dies or any of these die, fungi will decompose them and return the nutrients back to the plants in the soil so they can rebuild more plants. Trophic level. So troph generally means something like along the lines of energy. Okay. So auto, like automobile, right, means self. So autotrophic means basically an organism that makes its own energy by itself, which would be plants. Heterotroph. We're going to look at the root. Now, hetero means other or different, right? So heterotrophs get their energy from other sources, aka they're eating things. Now, a trophic level is a position in a food chain. So you're going from the lowest to the highest. So for plant, we are going to have the lowest level, right? So that would be a level, oh, this writing is not great. We're going to work with it. That would be a level zero for the plant, right? Because they're not consuming anything. And then herbivores eat plants. So their trophic level number is going to be a one because they are a primary consumer, right? Primary literally means one. Now, the secondary consumer is the one that eats the primary consumer, right? So it's tier number two. So it's trophic level is number two, and this is how we number it. Now, what follows two? Obviously the number three, right? So tertiary, the word tertiary means three. And so the tertiary consumers are marked with the number three. And then we move on to the next number or the next level that's eating the tertiary consumers and quaternary means the number, you guessed it, four. Okay, so we mark trophic levels with a number because it's more simple than writing out these huge terms every single time. Producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, quaternary consumers, right? So we can use the number zero for primary because that's the original source of where the energy from the sun is getting pulled into a food web. And then primary is one, secondary is two, tertiary is three, and quaternary is four. Okay, so that's kind of cool to go through. Now, we just said this, right? So primary consumers eat the producers because they're the first ones eating somebody else. Secondary eats the primary, right? Two is bigger than one, two eats one. Three eats two, tertiary eats secondary. And quaternary, four eats three. Quaternary eats tertiary. So a food web shows all the possible relationships in an ecosystem at each trophic level, and it's a network of interconnected food chains. So you tell me, which one's more complicated, a food chain or a food web? That's right, the answer is a food web, right? Because a food chain is just one line. But if you have a bunch of food chains in an area and you combine them all into a big web, you get that complicated food web. But the food web is important because it shows more information than a single chain. So just comparing them visually, you can already tell that the food chain on the right side is a lot simpler than the food web on the left side. However, you can find this food chain within the food web, right? So again, a food web is a bigger scale for a whole ecosystem and a food chain is a small linear path within that ecosystem. Let's talk a little bit about ecological pyramids. Now, an ecological pyramid is a pyramid that shows the feeding relationship of groups of organisms and the flow of energy through the different trophic levels of a given ecosystem. Now, I know knowing the chains in the web is important in the organisms, but knowing where the energy is going and how the energy is going is actually probably a little bit more important. So each level on an ecological pyramid only gets 10% of the energy in the level directly below it. This is known as the 10% rule. It's straightforward, the 10% rule, right? So if you start at 100%, you're gonna drop down to 10% when you go from producer to primary consumer. So you're going to drop all the way down to 10%. Now, 10% of 10%, when you go from primary consumer getting eaten by a secondary consumer, 10% of 10% is only 1% because you're moving that decimal over once. Now, 10% of 1%, if you move the decimal over one more time, when the tertiary eats the secondary and you move it over one more time, it's going to be 0.1%. So this 10% rule tells you that each level has less and less energy 
because the rest of the energy is leaving as heat, right? If you move around and you work out and you burn your energy in your body, your body is radiating heat into the atmosphere. And that's how a lot of the energy is lost, right? But if somebody ate you, or if there's a uh, tier of organism that eats humans, they'll get 10% of the energy from what the human had originally consumed from something else. Again, this is called the 10% rule because 10% is going up at a time. So let's do a practice question. An energy pyramid is shown on the right, which best explains why a pyramid is used to represent energy flow within an ecosystem? Right, is it available energy increases when moving up an energy pyramid, so there's more energy at the top? Is it available energy decreases when moving up an energy pyramid, so there's less at the top? Is it the size of the organisms decreases when moving up an energy pyramid? So like the tertiary consumer has to be a small animal. Is that true? And then is it the population size of the organisms increases when moving up an energy pyramid? Does it look like there's more wolves than grass and deer? No, the answer is B. Another practice question. So you see this food web over here. It's a little bit blurry, but I'm going to ask you, tell me what is one producer in this food web? Tell me just one. Right. We have oats, we have clover, and we have sunflower. So if you said any of those three, you're correct. Tell me one consumer in this food web. Right. So basically anything in this food web that's not the oats, the clover, or the sunflower is a consumer because it's going to eat something. In this ecosystem, is more energy available to the field mouse population from eating spiders or from eating oats? I want you to try to think back of how you're supposed to number your food web with the trophic levels. Remember, producers are number zero, primary consumers are number one, secondary consumers are number two, tertiary consumers are number three, and then quaternary consumers are number four. So you're going to take your uh, pen or pencil and just kind of write out. So we know that clover is a producer, so they get zero. And we know that oats and sunflowers are also producers, so they get zero. So if a field mouse is eating the sunflower, it gets to number one, right? And if the oats are being eaten by grasshoppers, it gets to number one there, right? And if rabbits, for example, are eating clovers, then they get number one because they're a primary consumer. So I want you to mark yours and think about what numbers all of these animals have in here. And then based on those numbers, you should be able to say, hey, if the sunflower at zero has 100% of the energy from the sun, then over here with the field mouse, if it goes one level up, it should only have, it should only have 10%, right? From that 100%. And if the field mouse gets eaten, uh, let's say the field mouse is getting eaten by the red-tailed hawk here, the red-tailed hawk's got a number two, right? So if it's two, then 10% of 10% is going to be 1%. So it's decreasing as you go. And I want you to follow the food chain. If you go from the field mouse and eating the spiders, or if you go from the field mouse eating the oats, which one does it get more energy? So which one gets the bigger number? Right, so if you go from oats to field mouse, that's one, that's 10%, right? If you go from the oats to the grasshopper to the spider, that means the spider is two. And then the field mouse eating the spider becomes a number three or a tertiary consumer. Now, we're gonna compare the 10% from directly from the oats to being a tertiary going through this loop right here. Whereas from oats, the grasshopper would be 100 to grasshopper, which is 10, over to the spider, which would be one, and then over to the uh, field mouse, which would be 0.1%. Now you tell me which one of these is bigger, right? We can tell that going directly from the oats to the field mouse, getting 10% is much bigger. So you'd be saying that the field mouse gets more energy from eating the oats directly. Cool, that's all I have for today. So make sure that, again, if you go and view the agenda, um, the next thing that you have is to go do your interactive journal as practice, and then you have an exit ticket.